Top Med Talk. Hello and welcome to Top Med Talk. We are here for Ebb Palm Island in the beautiful countryside of Dingle Ireland, the Dingle Peninsula in County Kerry. And it has been absolutely fabulous. The meeting here has been going on the last couple of days. We have one more day left of all kinds of wonderful content, fabulous presentations by world-renowned speakers, presenters, and people from the perioperative space. So we will be putting this out on Top Med Talk, the lectures and panel discussions, as well as some of the other discussions that we've been able to have for our fireside chat. There is a little fireplace right over here. It's super sweet. Um, so welcome to Three Chapel, your host, and I'm joined by three of uh, the attendees of the meeting, presenters to the meeting, and also three attendees of another group that we're here in town with, the Perioperative Quality Initiative, or POKI. So I, with great pleasure, introduce Anushka Alfonso. Hello, Anushka. How are you? Good. It's a pleasure to be here. Desiree. Okay. We're going to talk about the experience so far, because I know this is the first time you've been to Ireland. Yes. <laughs> Kate Leslie from Australia. Hello, Kate. How are you? Great. Thanks for having me on Top Make Talk. That's right. Once again, you Once are again. a fan fave is what I always like to say, as well as Bobby Jean Schweitzer. Hello, Bobby Jean. Hello, Desiree. It's delightful to be here. It is. And a fan fave as well. I love you and Top Med Talk. <laughs> no, no, our fans love you, Bobby oh, Jean. No, no, oh, oh, yeah, no, I thought you meant the other way around. Oh, I'm no. a fan of Top Med Talk. Oh, well, thank you. you. That's very sweet. No, no, all of our fans love, love you. And the conversations that we've had over the years with you guys have been absolutely fantastic. I thought since all of us were in the same room and we wouldn't have to do any of this virtually, that it would be a good time to sit down and have some conversation really about the conference. I would love to hear what you think about Dingle, Ireland, and uh, everything we've done so far, because you know we're always t- wanting people to come to this meeting because it is absolutely fantastic. But to hear it from you know, your all's uh, mouth would be great. And then talk about some themes that we've heard over the, the last couple of days. So Anushka, I'll start with you because I heard, I heard that you've had a fabulous time here in uh, beautiful County Kerry. I have. This is my first time in Ireland. You know, what I expected and what I actually experienced were very different things. <laughs> yeah. The food here is very good. Yes. And I didn't expect to have the range of seafood along this beautiful yeah. coast. The people are wonderful. They're yeah. very warm and inviting. Yeah. And the collaboration at the Dingle at Palm meeting, the level of conversations, mm-hmm. the meeting of the minds mm-hmm. has been simply wonderful. I just recommend people to come again, and I definitely will attend again. Yeah. Kate, what about you? Is this your first time to Ireland? No, I've been to Ireland before, but this meeting is like a lot of others I've been to where they're set in a beautiful place, and it sort of frees your mind a bit, I think, and takes you away from your normal environment. And I think it helps you absorb the information and reflect on it and discuss it with people and it's the first time that I've ever given a lecture looking out at a storm on a on a remote Irish bay. That was really it's pretty special, isn't fantastic. it? <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I recommend it to anyone, except we don't want too many people here well, because that would true. ruin it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a best kept secret, I think, in the world of perioperative medicine meetings for sure. But yeah, it's always good to expand. But I will I will hundred percent agree with you. I think having our conversations and and just doing this learning in this setting is so wonderful. And you it's a great privilege. It is. It is. That is absolutely what it is. Yeah. Baba Jean, what about you? Your thoughts? Yes. I mean, I agree with everything that both Kate and Anushka have, have commented on. It was This is my first time also to yeah. Ireland and I expected green and expected some rolling hills and some rain um, and some sheep. But yeah. um, there's been like this dramatic lots of rain and then later like beautiful sunshine yeah. coming through the clouds. It's like changes on the day. Yes, <laughs> amazingly. So, and uh, just a lot of sheep. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of sheep. <laughs> a lot of sheep. <laughs> so we were participating in the POKI, the Perioperative Quality Initiative, but it was the value proposition of perioperative medicine. And I think all four of us here feel that this has been a really important topic and something that it's worth investing time into and furthering the conversation. Just really quickly, Anushka, what did you think about the POKI sessions that we did over the three days and really kind of took a deeper dive into where we're thinking about the value proposition of perioperative medicine and how we want to expand that over the next several pokies. So this was my first pokey experience. That's and right. So this was all new to me. 
But I think just looking at my experience over the last weekend and the interactions and how it was planned, it was very organized, number one. And number two, I think when we think about the value of perioperative medicine, really defining what the value is in that landscape Mm -hmm. and how it means different things to different people and different perspectives is really important through which lens you're looking at. Mm -hmm. Are you looking at it from a payer perspective? Are you looking from a healthcare organization perspective? Are you looking at it from the physician perspective or the patient? And realizing there may be different emphasis on different elements of the value proposition through those lens. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Kate, what are your, what are your thoughts on that? Is it, this is the first pokey that you participated yes. in? Yes. Yes. And, you know, you were bringing in the Australian perspective. What do you think about the process and then, you know, what we were discussing in the room? Um, I thought it was really interesting. I mean, Guy Ludbrook is the one bringing the, the real mm-hmm. meat of the Australian perspective to the group because of his expertise in health economics mm-hmm. and so forth. I found the first day really interesting, you know, finding out about what patients really want mm-hmm. or, you know, what they what they really don't want mm-hmm. um, is uh, interesting. And it sort of dovetails in with the overarching theme of this discussion about women that quite often in healthcare it's been what, uh, men want, mm-hmm. which is what's been, or what men think that men want, has been delivered to women and other people. And so I liked the way that the idea was that we should be getting individualized ideas about value from people and trying to tailor it to them. The different stakeholders. It's a really nice idea. And yeah. it's not just women, it's people with other gender identities and other people who live in different places and have different ancestry. Yeah, absolutely. So say an economic divide. I mean, there's all the, the diversity. Of, name it. There's, yeah. there's something diverse about it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Bobby Jean, your thoughts? Yes, this is my first pokey as well. Mm-hmm. I didn't really know what to expect, especially since I was um, sort of put in charge of one day leading the discussion. You know, you just always say yes with this group. Well, you know, <laughs> and it's, you like, did you know it. it's usually, you know, see one, do one, teach one. But this was more like just, you know, do it, do it, do it. it. Right, right. <laughs> you know, it was a you know, fascinating discussions. And I think, you know, we were allowed to kind of wonder with our ideas yeah. a bit. But then there were people in the group that kept us on track. You know, I thought it was so enlightening to really have right in front of us that pie chart that showed the strong contribution, the significant contribution of social determinants of health and the outcomes and drivers of costs compared to, you know, interventions that we even do in medicine. Mm -hmm. And I think that we all know that there's you know, an increasing burden of disease, Mm -hmm. and that is putting pressures on a lot of societies. And there's only so much time, resource, money, personnel, right? Like all of those costs of delivering healthcare. And when we start to divert them to perhaps, you know, small groups of people, or very, very expensive or time intense therapies that benefit just a small group of people, there's that price to pay of what the missed opportunities to deliver either other health care or to deliver other services mm-hmm. to individuals, be that food and shelter and education, mm-hmm. um, especially to women. It's been in some places, right? We know that in a lot of places, women sort of get what's left over. Yeah. Hopefully we'll be able to come together again within the next year or so once we've kind of gotten, I think we have three more sessions of the value proposition of perioperative medicine pokies to participate in that look at the U.S. perspective that look like an international underdeveloped country society perspective, and then kind of coming back and and putting it all together, not just U.S., but developed countries. So I hopefully we'll be able to kind of dig into this a little bit more and then see where we come out and really truly look at the value that I think most of us have contributed a lot of our work to. So, But here at the meeting, it's been so interesting to hear some of the themes that have come out and questions that we have been talking about during the different panel discussions, one of which is women in research, women in perioperative medicine, women as one of the cohorts that we look at or or groups that we look at in the research that we do and the disparities or perhaps not in all of those things. Bobby Jean, yesterday in your lecture, you kind of talked about 
the difference between men and women and kind of ask a question, you know, to the audience, like, should we be thinking, is there a difference in provider type between women and men? Am I saying that right? Like, what was it kind of how, how did you address that yesterday? What was your talk about? And then how, what was kind of you bringing in there? My talk was giving a perspective on the U.S. or American risk assessment yes. and optimization. So I, you know, touched on a variety of things from, you know, identification of the typical sort of predictors of, you know, the comorbidities, the types of surgeries patients are having, and then increasing the age and frailty. Talked a bit about how we have used different risk calculators to put together for that, and then how they, many of them fall short. Mm -hmm. They fall short either because they just will stratify a patient for one particular risk outcome, a pulmonary risk, for example, or a cardiac risk, but not a global risk, or perhaps not the risk that patients are most interested mm -hmm. in too, which is like the risk that I won't be in to be able to live independently. Mm -hmm. I won't be able to take care of myself. And, you know, this, this may apply even more, you know, specifically to women because A, we live longer. Mm -hmm. We're often left, you know, widowed or the last surviving members of our family with no one to take care of us. Mm -hmm. And we're often the caregivers for other people as well. So then the burden of, you know, caring for other people who may be, elderly or don't have the outcomes that they hope for after surgery specifically, need additional care. It often falls on the women, the daughters. I didn't touch on this in my lecture, but I recall one study years ago that I came across that predict that one of the most, best predictors of whether one would end up in a skilled nursing facility was the number of daughters you had. Yeah. It's oh, not really? the number of children. It was not uh, <laughs> how much money you had necessarily or income. Yeah. So those kinds of things can often help, but it was how many children you have. Ah. I mean, how many daughters, daughters you, have. you have. Yeah. Um, we know the United States, at least, interestingly enough, in some studies of staying out of a nursing home or how well you recover post-op after having surgery is different depending on whether you are come from an immigrant population or not, whether you are first generation immigrants, and in, in, in fact, which countries you come from or what backgrounds. And uh, Hispanic families, patients tend to do much better mm. when they go home to Hispanic families than any other ethnic group. Um, and more, it, it's more important than um, the resources that they have otherwise with like money and those kinds of things. And it's often because they're very large extended families Yeah, and that the women particularly, they give care to people Yeah, and they are used to taking care of, and they will sacrifice their own, you know, sometimes health, safety, pleasure to care for individuals in their family. So I think that we have had some observational studies, granted, no randomized control studies, studies that I'm aware of, of the the either uh, associations of like sexes with caregivers and patients, or, you know, like cultures of caregivers and patients, yeah. or even, you know, caregivers and patients speaking the same languages, that one can often see, you know, uh, better outcomes when there's matching mm. of caregivers and their patients on many levels. And most of that studies have, I think that information has been coming from, you know, often primary care groups, the like. And, you know, more recently, there's been a few observational studies, surgeons, sex differences, female patients having male surgeons and vice versa, female patients having, you know, female caregivers or surgeons and the opposite. And showing some interesting benefits associated with when genders are matched. Mm -hmm. I only know of one study that I remember seeing of anesthesia providers mm. that they did not show a difference in mm. whether it was, you know, a female anesthetist and a female patient or the uh, opposite. So I don't know that it's that women are going to be better at doing something, especially medicine, particularly surgery than men, but in some you know, deeper studies of looking at some of the characteristics, whether it's that that we have that many women have different communication styles, mm -hmm. different, you know, collaboration 
particularly with, you know, team members. We know that medicine now is a team sport. Yeah. You know, it's no longer the captain of the ship and all you need is a great surgeon or a great you know, anesthetist and everything will be fine. <laughs> yeah. But that, you know, it's really the the weakest link in the team. Yeah. That, you know, if if the equipment isn't sterilized properly. Yeah. That's then the patients are at risk for surgical side infections. It, you know, the surgeon may scrub well and everybody, but you know, it only takes one exposure to a bug, an organism. Mm-hmm. So I think that we need to observe more this team sport of medicine and particularly yeah. perioperative medicine and see where we can, you know, identify yeah. where we do better at things and then bring that into the whole team. Yeah. And sometimes that may be observing how female teams work differently than male teams yeah. or how mixed teams work differently than either all sex teams. Yeah. So Kate, th- thank you for going through that, Bobby Jean, because I think that sets up a lot of the conversation I want to have today. Kate, we, we've had previous conversations. You worked with the BJA and did a Women in Medicines series and participated in that. I think it was, was it 2018, I think is when that happened. And we we caught up in Prato and, and talked a little bit about that. At the time, you know, I, I, I believe that in Australia and the work that you've done, um, maybe looks a little bit different than some a- other areas in the world. I know certainly from what you were talking about, the experiences that you had um, are a little bit different than I feel like happens in the U.S. and in part of kind of the culture there. But can you tell us a little bit, if you if you can, dredge up some of that information <laughs> from back then um, and and talk to us a little bit about, you know, the disparities in, in women in medicine, whether it's caregivers or the the actual patients themselves? I know that's a big, broad question, but kind of tackle it from there. I think Obi-Jean raised two interesting avenues of discussion. Uh, In our pokey discussion, there was lots of economic evaluation of the costs of healthcare, and included in that was the cost of the days lost from work of the people who were looking after the patient when they went home. Like the the direction of model, modern healthcare has been strongly in the direction of cost shifting to the patient. Yeah, you know, yes. especially in a system like mine where being in hospital may not cost any money, it's actually cheaper to be in hospital than at home. Oh, yeah, okay. But what what wasn't included in any of those analyses was the cost of the unpaid work. Mm-hmm. done by mainly women yes. in the world. And, I mean, that uh, work is worth trillions of dollars yeah. and has never been paid. Yeah. And, you know, it could be characterised in using various strong language. But <laughs> <won't> <laughs> no, not here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe so over, over. That was, that's one thing. The next thing was the, the fascinating work that Bobby Jean brought up about the provider, yeah, which I have to say was in the context of a marvellous lecture about a whole bunch of other interesting uh-huh. things, <laughs> it was. but it really tweaked the uh, interest of, it did, but of that was the a, audience. Your question, one of your questions, actually, that kind of got that going. Yes. Well, I think uh, this work is by necessity observational, unless we could somehow do a randomised trial where there really was a randomised allocation of the patient and the surgeon and the procedure to male and female practitioners. That's, you know, impossible (laughs) to do. So a lot of the work is observational and it relies on sophisticated statistical techniques to try and make the two groups as similar as possible using propensity score mm-hmm. that type of system yeah but uh, you can never measure or even imagine all of the confounding variables yeah. so it's an imperfect science but there's a particular problem with research in this area which is about clustering mm. which is about does female sex determine the, the type of surgery that you offered you know that's referred mm. to you in our country, we do, in private practice, we practice by invitation from the surgeon. So, you know, will the women be invited to do different lists to the men? Or You know, there's so many different variables. I mean, you need to do a causal diagram before you start this research with arrows, sort of trying to work out what you think the direction of the associations are. And if you can't do that, then, you know, it's hard to... To, to then to do the analyses and come up with some conclusions. But I think that there's definitely something in it. And lots of the things that Bobby Jean brought up about 
teamwork, communication style, approachability, all those things, you know, really deserve further consideration. And in the discussion, I think it came up is that those qualities are present in people of all genders. Mm -hmm. And it would be really neat to try and separate out the qualities that make you a great physician from your gender and see if, you know, what, what, you know, if you're a, a man and you have those qualities, you know, yeah. what are your outcomes? Anushka, what are your thoughts well, kind of think, as we're having this discussion? Yes. No, I think we had mentioned, Desiree, about even personality types. Yeah. There may be a difference in terms of women in leadership roles mm-hmm. and personality types versus in different subspecialties of medicine. What makes someone persevere? Yeah. What's the grit? How much mentorship do you have? Yeah. Especially in academic medicine. I'm sitting next to two women here who are who've broken through a lot of barriers to get to where they are. And yeah. I'm in awe of what they've accomplished. But it I have to add, it takes hard work. Yeah. Nothing's nothing's for free. And I think I get a little frustrated sometimes with younger people just wanting to get the results without putting the hard work. I think Whatever you have to do, you have to put in hard work. Yeah, absolutely. Kate, I think someone asked the question or in research, and is there a particular barrier for women in that space? And you were saying, and I think you've said this before, that you know the work that you guys have done in Australia, you've really tried to make it easier for women to be involved and figure out how to pull them in early as part of the process. So it just becomes part of training and regardless of what gender you are. Is that, am I saying that correctly? Yeah. Yeah. So a a process of normalization and of research as part of everyone's practice as an anesthesiologist, right Mm -hmm. from when, you know, the training program is really important. And then um, having, I guess, Australia and New Zealand are, are countries with very flat social structures. And maybe that is one of the reasons why we've been able to collaborate in the way we have in the in the trials group. Um, it also helps that we work for our hospital systems, not for universities. We don't have an imperative to do anything in particular except provide clinical care. Hmm. And it, it makes you sort of freer to follow your path and to publish, to have a, a career that doesn't have to be on a persistent trajectory anywhere. Okay. So in our trials group, there are stacks of late bloomers in research. <laughs> you know, you can make a contribution at any time yeah. of your life. But interestingly, a lot of the women we have in our department doing a research have young children. Mm-hmm. So they, you know, they're not finding that an insurmountable barrier to getting their work done. And similarly, you know, in this day and age, we have men with young children who are providing a significant amount of the child rearing activities. Yeah. So I think with determination and as Anushka said, hard work, not you know, not overwhelmingly you know, you don't yeah. want to work too hard. <laughs> I sound like an Australian then you don't want to work too yeah, hard. Why would you want to work? You've got a solid effort. You need to be optimistic about yeah, about your prospects. Yeah, I think. All right, Bobby Jean, what was your experience like? You've been doing academic medicine longer than we have, and you know what were challenges like for you? I think in the past, particularly in the United States, I think it was somewhat of a very different culture than mm-hmm. what it is now, even and what you described, Kate, in Australia, and that I think a lot of women were intimidated by academic medicine, not just research, but academic medicine, because it was often this sort of, you know, publish or perish, up and out. And there were some very significant, you know, time constraints. Mm -hmm. And those came at very also inopportune times for a lot of women, right? At the time when they were, you know, having children or needed to have children if they wanted to have children Mm -hmm. because they weren't going to have time. And we had incredibly, you know, outdated, you know, opportunity or resources, like no childcare opportunities mm-hmm. at the hospitals, no maternity paid maternity leave. In general, I think, you know, childcare and outsourcing in costs such as you know, your household help is much more expensive often in the United States mm-hmm. than I've heard about in other countries. 
And so I think a lot of women, you know, and, and also I think the difference between the pay that they could receive in a private practice academic, I mean, a private practice anesthesia setting was significantly different yes. in an academic setting. So I think for a lot of women, they chose that. There was also sometimes not even an opportunity to work part-time in academics, because if you were part-time, you were automatically on the mommy track, which meant you could not be, you weren't eligible for a uh, professorship or that track. Yeah. So I think, unfortunately, that's kind of stuck around a bit too, for a lot of women going into to medicine. Mm -hmm that you know, they just thought that academics was not a very conducive place to balance having a family mm -hmm. and taking care of their children. And maybe Australian men are a little bit better <laughs> about know, taking their share. But, it, you know, I was just listening to a recent uh, podcast around, you know, the imbalance of women and men and what they do at home. Yeah. And this wasn't just, you know, for physicians. And I was shocked to learn that women who make more money than their <laughs> significant others actually do more housework. They do more. Yes. Yes. 100%. Isn't that shocking? That's in it's, Australia. There's that data as well. It's crazy. Shocking. To me. So, and and we're know, the caregivers and we're the, all the yeah, things that we just yes, went through right. earlier. <laughs> you know, and so I do think there's still, even though men have are starting to do more and more for their families outside of their paid jobs or their real jobs, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know I think Sorry. they're doing more and more, but still women yeah. are still, you know, in some ways I feel like I've had three jobs. Glad I came up in on the tails of that women's lib. You know, yeah. I had an opportunity mm -hmm. to, you know, have an education, have a career, but in some ways I feel like, you know, I was a full-time employee. I was a full-time mother. I was a full-time child still, you know, taking care of my elderly mm -hmm. parents and the yeah. caregiving. I have four, I guess, and a full-time spouse, <laughs> um, you know, so I do think that we haven't made as much progress as we could have made yeah. in supporting women. I think because we also have this lack of a lot of women researchers and a lot of women chairman and department mm -hmm. heads, at least in the United States, right. that, you know, if you don't, you know, they don't want to have, we don't have those, those models, those yes. mentors, we don't have those people to say, hey, They've done it. I can do it too. Yeah. But I think that, you know, a research career and an academic career has given me often much more control over my time mm. so that yeah. I could, you know, go home, put the kids to bed, get dinner ready, and then write some papers. Work for hours write writing. Right. <laughs> it, it, it was challenging. I had to give up some of my own personal, yeah. perhaps self-care, but I could control that more than when I was just in the operating room all the time. And, you know, couldn't leave my patients. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I always, this reminds me, and Anushka, I definitely want to bring you in this conversation, but it reminds me during that BJA conversations that we had in Prato, I can't remember if it was Megan Lane Fall or Liz Everett, but talking about mentors and, you know, women having mentors, but then there's also sponsors. Mm -hmm. So the, and the difference between the two mentors is just kind of telling you what to do. Sponsors are actually helping you. Um, and, giving you opportunities. And giving you opportunities. You yes. It's that sponsor is the right word, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. And and that just kind of took me back a little bit. I'm like, that. there's a difference, mm -hmm. you know, um, about actually granting opportunities. And I think... You know, there, there's we on top of my talk, we have had some cool conversations about that to, to look back upon. Um, Anushka, did you have a different experience going through your career? So up until this point, and um, do you think it's changing? I think for both of you guys as and, and Liz too, as, as you, we're bringing people up um, and pr potentially sponsoring other women as they come into the field. Well, first of all, I'm in more of a, you know, mid-career right now, yeah. 10 years into my uh, clinical work at Sloan. And I've seen a shift in the last five years. There's more opportunity now than there was earlier. And I do agree. The There's still less women in academic anesthesiology and leadership roles. Women don't really see that as an avenue to go to. And I think that has to do with the mentorship or the fact that this could be a possible career track. And it does allow a degree of flexibility at the same time, it allows for innovation and curiosity, that, which is why I really love academic medicine mm -hmm. and anesthesiology and seeing what we talked about and how can we integrate all the research that's going on to change practice for the better for our patients. And that's very exciting. 
But I think there needs to be a lot of work done in terms of opening up more doors for people who are interested in this field and show that this is a possibility. But there has to be work that is involved to go through and continue to go through and maintain that path. Mm -hmm. And I think you can't have one without the other. Like you said, the last probably five years that, you know, paternity leave has even been a thing that anyone has ever discussed um, and the shifting roles and the people, some of the men who seems to be who are leading now have like a different or maybe a better understanding, I guess, of of the challenges that are, that are women have been facing. So um, any kind of final thoughts? I mean, I know I'm sure we could sit here for a long time and and, <laughs> and talk about all that. Um, Barbara Jean, any final thoughts? Specifically related to women in mm-hmm. medicine? Yeah, mm-hmm. I think it's, you know, I think it's uh, still exciting times to see more and more women, particularly in anesthesiology, mm-hmm. at least in the U.S. I know it's growing in tremendously. It's more than 50% of medical students now are women. And I think that men are also learning. I think we women are training and maybe raising our boys a bit differently yeah, too, with expectations. Yeah. Um, and I have a son who I love dearly, and I see all of the great value that men bring. My son, my husband, my colleagues. So I think we just need to help support each other. I've had great male mentors and sponsors, and I think that it's just a matter of realizing that all the different perspectives that we bring to this Mm -hmm. will really enrich, and we will learn from it and be better providers, better friends, better researchers, colleagues, academicians, and take better care of our patients. Yeah. I agree with everything that was said, and I, I think I'm going to kind of contradict what I said before yeah. now. Which, but you know, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> that's the, one of the good things about talking to Top Meg. Talk, you know, <laughs> ideas evolve even in the moment. It's that's yeah. absolutely very, very true. <laughs> but I'm recalling a conversation I've had uh, in another part of my trip overseas. Is if we wait for grassroots evolution of women in medicine and in the world in general, then according to one analysis I saw, it will take 195 years for women to achieve the same amount of power in the world as men. That's way too far away. Yeah. So apart from training more female physicians and more female anesthesiologists and encouraging people through mentorship and sponsorship and getting the young docs having doctoral, you know, PhDs and so forth, we need to appoint women to the chairmanship of departments, Mm -hmm. to the editor-in-chief of major mm. anesthesia journals to the presidency of the United States. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, to, yes. <laughs> to the prime ministership of Australia, etc. cetera. Yeah. We can't. There, we have to make those really big roles more, more attractive or yeah. work out. Most organisations are trying to find women to interview for those roles and then and they 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 you know they don't get mm-hmm. as many applications as they would like even for window dressing the role mm. so i think uh it's a multi-pronged attack yes. but i remain you know optimistic yeah. and i'm looking forward to th- to thrashing it out this evening over another, yeah, I love that. another yes. pint of Guinness. That's another one. We're going to wrap up here. Anushka, we're not sitting here. This is, this is not man bashing. This is not doesn't have anything to do with that or saying someone's better than the other. But it's like, how do we empower our gender to, to step up here? Well, I think I'm very hopeful. And just talking to these lovely ladies who I've met for the first time makes me even more excited about what's potential and what's possible. And I do agree with what Professor Leslie had said. Kate, please. <laughs> Kate had said, if you don't know what's possible and can visualize what's possible, you don't know that's a possibility. Yes. If you don't see women in leadership roles, you don't know that could be an avenue that, oh, I could apply for that job. And women in general want to have all their T's do- uh, crossed and all the I's dotted before applying for a position. Yes. Men, they don't care. They're like, they don't care. They're they like, put themselves I, out there. They're just, you know, yeah. they, go for they, they go for it. And I yeah. think women need to go for it sometimes yeah. and just see what happens. Yeah. It's great having amazing role models. I think it's, I, I think we really need to just go for it. Yeah. 
On that note, ladies, I think it's time for us to go get ready for the gala later tonight, (laughs) where there will be a lot of all of those things and lots of good fun. Thank you for sitting down. Thank you for all the leadership that you guys have within our field of perioperative medicine. And I look forward to future conversations about all these things. So thanks for giving me a little bit of time on this one. Cheers. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for downloading Top Med Talk. Don't forget to subscribe via your podcatcher. Don't forget to check us out on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And also, don't forget, Top Med Talk is the broadcasting arm of EdPom, evidence-based perioptive medicine. We'd love you to find out more about that. If you check out edpom.org, you can find low prices on some of the conferences we're organizing around the world. Many of them are virtual and don't even involve you leaving your own home. Check out ebpom.org now.